it's Clayton. Welcome to howtodrawcomics.net. Right here in this video, I'm going to show you the same colouring techniques I used to take my comic book illustration of Michelangelo from this to this. In this tutorial, you'll learn how to pick appealing colour palettes for your artwork and then how to render it using the airbrush and lasso technique. You'll discover how highlight and shadow overlays can be used to create dynamic colour shifts that simulate realistic environmental lighting conditions and then I'll show you how to ensure that your artwork reads correctly through light to dark value balancing. And finally, I'll show you the adjustment layering techniques that I like to use to polish off my comic book creations. I hope you enjoy the video. To get the ball rolling, I'm going to begin by laying down the base colours, also known as the flats for Michelangelo and his surrounding environment. This initial stage is all about establishing the core colour scheme for your comic book illustration. Arming myself with an opaque hard-edged brush, I'll tackle Mikey first by picking a desaturated teal green for his scaly reptilian skin. Some depictions of the Ninja Turtles actually have them each with a unique variation of hue, and that's why I've added a slight hint of blue into the mix with Mikey. Those subtle tonal shifts lend more toward their unique personalities and individuality, which is important to define when it comes to the Ninja Turtles because when you think about it, they are all effectively of the same design. Each Ninja Turtle's skin colour somewhat complements the colour of their masks too. For example, if I was colouring Donatello here instead, I'd add more yellow to the green, which would be a closer complement to his purple mask. Raphael, on the other hand, would have a darker, deeper, potent green that would partner up perfectly with his red mask. Some colours look good together and some look terrible. A terrible colour scheme means an unpleasing aesthetic experience for your audience. So as important as it is to lay down the colours for the individual elements within your illustration, it's just as important, if not more important, that they coordinate well together. To help me do that, I use Photoshop's Colour Picker panel. You'll see it pop up from time to time as I go in to select a new colour to work with. The cool thing about this is that it gives you a preview of both your current and your new selection. Seeing them both next to one another allows me to observe by eye whether or not they're going to clash. And if they do, I simply adjust the hue and colour intensity until I find the sweet spot for that particular combination. As I lay down the orange colour of his mask, for example, I'm not just picking any value range of orange for it. I'm first making sure that it sits nicely beside the already established green of his skin. You can often pick complementary colours by eye after enough experience. In fact, even without a lot of colour picking experience, it's still likely that if it looks right to your eye, they'll be fine as is. Because the reason we find certain colour combinations more appealing than others is because we passively observe them as they pop up in the world around us every day. For example, if you were to take a walk in the park, Raphael's red and green primary colour scheme is the same colour scheme of a red rose in the deeply enriched green stem holding it up. Purple and pink look so incredible together because they are the same colours that illuminate from the beauty of an evening sunset. But if you're not so savvy at picking harmonious colour combinations by eye, you can always track down the trusty old colour wheel to help you out along the way. You can simply google it and you'll find a ton of visual examples and descriptions on how to use it. But my favourite colour composing resource by far is Adobe's interactive colour wheel. It's completely free to use and you can actually find it at Kula, spelt with a K, dot adobe dot com slash create slash color dash wheel. You'll notice that I'm keeping my color palette fairly desaturated here. In other words, the colors I'm using aren't as vibrant or potent, rather they're somewhat diluted. This is a stylistic choice, but I find colors in these value ranges seem to come across as more realistic. In nature, there are of course flecks of vibrant, attention-grabbing, contrasting colors, but a majority you'll find are really at full saturation. We are talking about comic art here at the end of the day, and comics weren't necessarily made to be realistic, so whether you use an intensely saturated colour scheme is completely down to the look you want for your artwork to have. 
consider that the colours you use will affect the way that people feel about your artwork. Bright, vibrant colours would suggest a piece of artwork that is full of energy and life, typically producing feelings of fantastical happiness and wonder. Dark and diluted colours have more of a serious undertone and can sometimes feel gloomy or even depressing. The same can be said for characters themselves. If you're colouring an expressive, eccentric, over-the-top character, you might pick a super-saturated palette for him to work with. But if you take the realistic depiction of a Ninja Turtle, well, these guys are shell reptilian mutants that dwell in the storm sewers of New York City. Vibrant, happy-go-lucky colours just don't come to mind here. Compare a video game like League of Legends or World of Warcraft to, say, a Silent Hill title, and you'll get the gist of what I'm trying to say here. Just experiment until you find an aesthetic for your artwork that you're happy with. The kind of colours that suit your style, genre, and theme. The brush I'm using to lay down the flats is 100% opaque, hard-edged Photoshop default with pen pressure applied. This is also the same brush I use to ink the pencils with, and you're likely to find something similar in whatever graphics application you're using, whether it be Manga Studio, Sketchbook Pro, or Photoshop. I keep the brush large to start off with as I fill in the bulk interior of each section. Then I shrink it down to a smaller size as I carefully go around the edge of the line art. It's important to keep it neat so that you don't end up having colours travelling outside their designated zones. It's almost exactly like colouring up a picture in a colouring in book, being sure to keep inside the lines. Each colour sits on a layer all of its own inside a layer group right underneath the inked line art in the layer list hierarchy. When working on these giant illustrations, layer lists can quickly begin to fill up, so it's important to name them appropriately and organise them to keep everything manageable. Otherwise, you might find you're spending an unreasonable amount of time trying to figure out which layer is where and what layer you need to be working on. Once the base colours are filled in, I'll create a new fill layer above them. Fill layers are special kinds of layers that consist of two main elements. First being the fill colour, and the second being a black and white height map that determines its visibility. This layer will be the shadow base for my scene, and where the initial lighting pass will take place. Now a common misconception is that shadows have no colour, that they're just grey or black. In reality, this isn't true at all. In fact, shadows have subtle, desaturated, cooler tones depending on the time of day. In this piece, the time of day is set at dusk, so I'm going to pick a purple-blue coloured fill for the shadow overlay to give my shadows a more realistic tone. The other reason for this particular shadow tone is that the core light will be a complementary orange since the time of day is set at dusk. To light the scene correctly, the first thing I decide on is the lighting direction. Every form I shade needs to remain consistent with the core light's position, otherwise you'll find lighting them a little disorientating. Consciously, keeping that main light in mind will save confusion and actually make the entire process run a whole lot smoother. As with the drawing itself, I think of every element within my illustration in terms of their most simple geometrical shapes. Why? Because lighting a cube is a heck of a lot easier than lighting a building. A sphere is much more manageable to render than a mutant pizza-eating turtle head. Keep it simple, keep it broad, and you'll find that the task of colouring becomes less complicated than you might have originally thought. Using a soft, round airbrush, I light the elements inside my illustration through different passes. For the first pass, no details are rendered out, no wrinkles, no scales, no warts, and no folds. What I am indicating, however, is the overall forms. I indicate the highlights on his head as if I were indicating the highlights on a ball. I think of his arms as cylinders and his chest as a primitive barrel shape. This base pass establishes the main values for my illustration. The smaller, more refined details that are built on top will now remain consistent with that light to dark range. It's important to note that we're not really dealing with the colours here anymore as such, but rather a gradient of dark to light values. You can see over in my colour palette that it consists only of black and white, 
everything pure white will be in pure shadow. Pure black will be pure white. It sounds a little strange and complicated, I know. It, it did to me when I first discovered this technique. But think of it as white being the amount of visibility that the shadow layer has over the rest of the image. To begin breaking up the larger forms into smaller forms, I'm going to use the lasso airbrush technique. This process consists of selecting various areas around the main box of geometry to increase the highlights and further define their shape. The way I like to choose my selections is by feeling out the underlying structure of those broader forms. So basically I'm thinking about where I might find the main muscle groups and bones. As I work in the smaller details, such as the scales, cracks, indentations or wrinkles, I'll make selections for those too. Once a selection is made, it's simply a matter of painting right over the top of them. I'm careful about this though, the intensity of a given highlight will vary depending on its position from the main light source. Every form has a lighting hotspot, a radial point where the form is lit at its highest value. For example, the lightest point on Michelangelo's head is at the top, where it gradiates out into shadow. You'll really have to use your best judgement as to how to balance the light to dark values for each form, because remember it's not only the forms themselves that you need to keep in mind here, but the overall areas of contrast within the image. In saying that, I use the pan pressure of my tablet to control the intensity of the highlights I'm painting in. If I want to keep the highlights subtle, I'll lightly tap in the selected area repeatedly until it's at the level of brightness I'm looking for. If the highlight needs to be intensified, I'll apply more pressure to the stylus. Sometimes pen pressure can be a little touchy, so if you find it difficult to get those subtler tones, you can try decreasing the opacity of your brush to let out less colour. I remember when I first discovered the comic book colouring lasso technique. Back then I could kind of draw decently, but I had no idea as to how to go about colouring it. Problem was to me, my artwork was only ever really a half finished product without those colours, so I was extremely driven to get it handled. I'd played around with Photoshop here and there using the burn and dodge tools, but could never really get anywhere near the result I was seeing in other comic book artwork. When you're flying blind without direction, I guess that's a given. Luckily I had a few inspirational examples I could cling on to. I was and still am a huge fan of Todd McFarlane's Spawn series. Love everything about it, the story, characters, the artwork, and of course, the way the colours were used to polish it up. I figured out early on I wanted to achieve a similar look in the way my artwork would be coloured too. So of course I typed Spawn comic colouring techniques into Google and would you believe it, I found a video tutorial course named Comic Style Colouring The Spawn Way by Brian Habelin. Needless to say, I instantly got my hands on it and did some serious hardcore study. More than the techniques themselves, rendering out the forms and balancing the contrast of the overall composition was the part I struggled with most. I simply didn't have enough experience with the forms and the intricacies of the anatomy under varying lighting conditions. One thing that did really help out though, and still helps me out to this day, is zooming out from my canvas and working at a distance. This allows me more control over how the established values read as a whole. That's also why I've got the navigator panel up there, because it effectively gives me that zoomed out view even when working in close to the canvas. Now it does take time to really master these skills though. In the beginning, when you're learning a new concept, it's always going to be a little awkward. This was especially true for me with colouring. I didn't understand that value and colour were two different things. I didn't understand how coloured light would mix into the coloured objects it would shine onto. I didn't know a thing about colour theory or psychology. But eventually, after failing, tweaking and learning from those mistakes, something just kind of clicked. Fear of failure is the number one thing that stops most of us from getting that far though. A boat in the port is safe, but that's not what a boat was made for. And it's scary sailing out into uncharted waters without a paddle. But accepting that failure is the inevitable necessity to the learning process is the only way to succeed. As you work, it helps to have a vision inside your mind as to how you want your illustration to ultimately look. 
The clearer you can make that mental image, the easier it'll be to direct yourself toward it as you work. For some, that can be a challenge. Not everyone is a visual thinker, and even those who are can have a tough time sorting out the details in their mind vividly enough to project them down onto paper. Something I like to do to really envision my idea with clarity is to create thumbnail sketches. These small, palm-sized sketches are basically compositional rough drafts of your idea that help convert it into a solid preliminary draft that can be later fleshed out into something more final. The reason these easily underestimated prelims are so valuable is because the ideas inside your mind often start out too cloudy to use as a sound reference alone. After creating a few small sketches though, it's incredible to witness how much more vivid they become. In fact, oftentimes they tend to evolve along the way. It's almost like turning the focus knob on a camera to bring that blurry image into a sharper view. Okay, now I'm selecting the individual bricks here one by one. As you can see, sometimes comic book colouring can be a tedious task, especially when you're spending longer than you would otherwise like to on one of the less interesting portions of the illustration. It's at these points I become tempted to procrastinate, which always causes production to drag out and motivation to diminish. Five minutes of Facebook or YouTube can turn into five or six hours easily. I remember when I discovered Tumblr for the first time, wow, did I become addicted to that. The trick is to keep the momentum going into these times of mind-numbing boredom, because the longer we leave it, the less motivated we become to working on it. Easier said than done, right? So how do we keep shoveling the coal into the engine? Simple answer is, get excited. Really try to visualize this magnificent masterpiece inside your mind and imagine just how awesome it's going to end up turning out only hours from now. The more you can pump yourself up, the easier it'll be to work through those draining bouts and stave off the temptation to slacken off. Once I'm done with the shadow overlay fill layer and the first pass of rendering, it's time to add in some colour to the core light that's lighting the scene. Now it's very rare to find pure white coloured light in the real world, unless in a sterile, unnatural environment such as a doctor's surgery or laboratory. Without this layer, the lighting in the image would come across as somewhat artificial. And because Mikey's outside, in the street, chowing down on some delicious pizza, we're going to need to keep it natural. To do this, I'm going to create a brand new layer just above the shadow overlay layer and name it Highlight Overlay. Then I'll set its layer mode to overlay, and now anything I paint onto this layer will literally be overlaid on top of the layers below. Keeping in mind the time of day, I'm going to select a pinky yellow hue, enlarge my airbrush size and begin painting right over the broader forms, just as I did in the previous step. Now since this layer is set to overlay, I can paint straight onto it while preserving the rendering work I've already done on the layers below. Except that everything below is now becoming colorized with the color I've selected for my light source. You can see how his green skin actually begins to become mixed in with the pink-yellow light overlay, as does his orange mask. If I don't like the way those colours are blending together, I can simply adjust the hue in the options menu, since it's on a completely separate layer. This step is also taken to help me create a workable colour palette for the final rendering pass of detailed highlights and spec. Once the light colour is blocked in, I go through the same lassoing and airbrushing process as last time, except now I'm zooming in and selecting even more detailed areas of the form. In many ways, this is a similar way to working with traditional painting. You're literally building up the highlights to increase contrast and specular bit by bit. And as you go through this process, the forms begin to pop out further and further as depth value is increased. This phase is really when the artwork begins to come to life and literally start to look 3D. To keep myself composed, I'm still thinking of this entire illustration as a bunch of boxes, cylinders and spheres. As long as I can simplify the image down like this in my head, I've got a pretty good idea as to where to increase the highlights hotspots. Something to keep in mind when rendering is the representation of different materials. Shiny materials, such as Mikey's skin and the chains of his nunchucks, are going to have more intense highlight hotspots since they reflect more light. 
matte materials absorb light, so objects like Mikey's shell and the background buildings will have less intense blended light to dark value shifts. Something I'll mention is that on my second monitor I've got a montage of reference material. If I'm ever in doubt as to what colours I should be leaning toward for Mikey or colour scheme ideas for New York City, those refs are there to keep me on track. This is especially true for drawing but also in colouring too. The Ninja Turtles are made up fictional cartoon characters of course that already have a fairly well established colour scheme. But if I was to do an ultra realistic reimagining of Michelangelo, I'd also probably have a lot of real life turtle, reptile, ninja, shell and bodybuilder photo references to create a realistic representation. Without the use of references, things begin to end up looking a little generic. Your ideas, your drawing, your colour schemes will all lack that spark. And it's because our brain needs food to inspire it and to generate ideas properly. I mean, getting unique ideas from an empty head is like getting blood from a stone. The brain is really good at relating new ideas to old ideas, but conjuring up something from nothing is near impossible. It needs something to get the ball rolling. Sometimes if I'm in doubt as to how to represent something in the comic book format, I'll even use other artists' work as a reference. Of course, you never want to copy or steal anybody else's work, that's a big no-no. What I'm talking about here is using them as more of a guide as to how the form should be rendered, the cityscape should be coloured or lit, or the appropriate amount of contrast that should be used. Whatever references you use, of course, still all comes down to the particular flavour you want for your own artwork. But I'd definitely suggest setting up a library of reference material and adding to it whenever you come across something that catches your eye. Since I typically like to keep my comic book artwork a little more on the realistic side in the realm of comics like Spawn, Witchblade or The Darkness, I've always opted to go for more of a high contrast airbrushy look. Now that's not the only comic book colouring style out there though, it's simply a stylistic choice I've made because I don't feel I'm able to achieve the kind of dimension I want to see in my artwork with simple cell shading. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that, it has its own look, and if that is a look that suits the kind of artwork you want to do, then you should totally go with it. Different styles vary from artist to artist, I think that's why it's important though to really find an artist you admire, and who inspires you, so that you can start developing your style from a place where you can see a possible destination. Up in the top right of Photoshop's interface, you'll notice I've got the colour panel on hand and set to HSB. Now HSB stands for Hue, Saturation and Brightness, and these sliders allow me to adjust each variable of any colour I have selected on the fly. With my colour palette already established, all I do to create the highlight colours is to pick an existing tone on the canvas by holding down Alt on my keyboard, and then simply adjusting it to a lighter brightness. Sometimes I'll add some warmth to my highlights by adjusting the hue slider slightly. This keeps the colours from looking too monochromatic and gives them more interest. So the highlights for his mask won't just be orange, they'll in fact be more of an amber hue. Even cooler colours have warmer tones, for example purple would be a warmer comparison to blue. You know, the other night I sat back and I re-watched the original 1990s Ninja Turtle movie for old times sake. I hadn't watched it in years and to be honest I was kind of worried that it wouldn't quite measure up to the fond childhood memories that I'd treasured all these years. But I'm happy to say I was not disappointed, Ninja Turtles is still tip top and you really can't beat those Ninja Turtle suits and the animatronics. In a way I feel like the four Ninja Turtle brothers really show that not only are we all individuals, but that despite those differences, together we're stronger, and through that, the times in which we struggle the most can be overcome, and our greatest feats conquered. Each Ninja Turtle deals with turmoil, insecurity and fear in different ways. In the movie, Leonardo was seen as the leader, and he knew, I think, that even in the face of losing that which was most important to himself and his brothers, he needed to keep his composure for the sake of the others. So he'd calm his mind, overcome his emotions, and he'd do that by meditating. Raphael, on the other hand, is the stark comparison to Leonardo, and in that movie it couldn't be more beautifully illustrated. When Raphael realizes Splinter is missing, he completely loses it emotionally and becomes enraged. 
and when the Foot Clan jump him, he completely unleashes it, but not without coming out the other end defeated. Which I think in itself is symbolic of the way we ourselves sometimes feel when in a situation outside of our control. Anyway, about halfway through I wondered why they were given blue, purple, orange and red as the colours of their masks. Was it just to tell them apart, or was there some kind of symbolic meaning behind it? Those colours are a big deal after all, they make up the very identity of each. That's how we recognise them and remember them. Turns out there's a lot of speculation, but no solid official reason from the original creators as to why those particular colours were chosen. I've got a sneaking suspicion that it is, however, a great deal to do with their individual personalities. I mean, Michelangelo was bright, charismatic, warming and friendly. You couldn't pick a better colour to describe the kind of fun-loving attitude he has. Then take Raphael, hot-headed, hot-tempered and rebellious. This guy's mask was made to be red hands down. Donatello is intelligent, creative and kind of mysterious. The eccentric purple just seems to go hand in hand. And finally there's Leo, the calm and collected leader of the Turtles who dons the blue mask. What I'm really getting at here is that when it comes to creating your own comic book characters, picking their colours is a big deal because people understand and relate to them not just visually but through feeling. And this really begins to get into the psychology of colour and how certain hues literally make us feel. The meaning we place on these colours is one that's conditioned through experience, media and society itself of course, and so you can use that to partly manufacture the way someone feels and relates to your characters. What I've done here is created a new adjustment layer that's sitting on top of the other layers in the hierarchy. I've gone into the properties of that layer and taken the colour saturation down to zero. What this allows me to do is check whether or not the dark to light values of my image are balanced and composed correctly without being distracted by the colours. These values are important because they contribute a great deal to how my viewers will read my image, where they'll focus and how their eye will travel throughout it. I'll make a few tweaks here and there by increasing the brightness in certain areas until those highlights are looking accurate. Focusing back in on the background, I'm going to reselect the bricks of the building behind Mikey one by one and give them a second highlight pass to increase the contrast of the gradient and make them pop. Next I'll head on over to the building, standing opposite this one. The flats of its windows have been preserved on a separate layer allowing me to use them as a selection mask. What I want to do here is actually turn some of the lights on inside this building, since the time of day is set to the evening. To do that, I'm going to deselect the windows I don't want lit, and I'm going to do so somewhat randomly to keep the composition from becoming too rigid. Once that's done, I'll create a new layer above the highlights layer, select the bright pink yellow from the colour picker, and run my brush over the top of the selection. Now this building is effectively a cube and needs to be lit as such, but to do it accurately, I need to track that main light source and figure out what side of the building will be directly hit and what will fall into shadow. If these two values aren't established, then the building effectively loses its shape. Now I simply make a selection for the light side, make sure I'm on the highlights layer, and increase the brightness. Straight away you'll notice the dimension of the building increase. I work my way around the rest of the background, addressing even the smallest of details such as the frames of the windows and the trim running around the rooftops of the buildings. Because backgrounds almost feel like a secondary component to the main subject, it can be tempting to rush through them. Try to resist the urge though, rushing is only going to drag down the quality of the rest of your image. I personally give backgrounds a great deal of importance when it comes to their contribution to an illustration. They're like a beautiful frame that surrounds the key elements of the artwork and grounds them into their own world. This offers your characters one of the highest standards of presentation possible and in turn creates a greater immersion for the viewer. To increase the three-dimensional depth of Mikey even more, I'm going to throw in a secondary blue colour light off to his left. This also gives the image more interest and a somewhat cinematic experience that enhances the drama of the scene. I'm sure to keep the intensity of the light low key in comparison to the core light as I don't want the two fighting one another for attention. The secondary light should always be less visually demanding than the main light. 
finally, to really give Mikey a final polish, I've added in a Photoshop adjustment layer called Curves. This is another special kind of layer that sits above the rest, acting as a kind of contrast controller to give the artwork some extra pop. Comic art is an art form that at its core contains a dramatic level of eye-catching contrast, primarily because of the solid black contour line art. Because of that, I've always felt that a highly contrasted airbrush finish where colour is concerned seemed to be the ideal aesthetic look the genre lent itself toward, which is why I really try to ramp it up in the end phase. That's not to say go crazy with it, you still want to be sensible enough that your shades are discernible from highlights, midtones, and shadows. What helps me to balance out the contrast in my own artwork is by comparing it directly to others. Again, if you're going to go down this route yourself, the amount of contrast in your work will then be greatly influenced by your particular taste and reference material. So it'll vary from artist to artist. After the curves adjustment layer, I like to add in another one called color balance. These two are really the only two adjustment layers I use to polish up the final piece, but there are a ton you can pick from in Photoshop, such as individual color selection adjustments, levels, exposure. Color balance allows you to create an overall tonal color harmony within the piece by either adding or subtracting certain hues. In my illustration here, I've lowered the cyan by increasing the amount of red, kept the balance between the magenta and green at its default, and subtracted from the yellow to add more blue. It comes down to personal preference, so when it comes to adjusting your own artwork, simply tweak away until you're happy with how it looks. Once I've finished up with the final adjustments, I'm ready to call it a day. That's all there is to it. If you like the video, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to the howtodrawcomics.net newsletter so that you don't miss any new tutorials. Until next time, see you later.